ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وازواجه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد او بريز دو تو الله وي بريز هيم وي سيك اللهز forgiveness and we ask Allah's aid and assistance and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds verily whosoever Allah guides no one can lead astray and whosoever Allah allows to go astray then no one can guide and I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and his messenger may Allah exalt his mention May Allah grant him peace, his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on their righteous path until the day of judgment. While the masses of Muslims today strive in either making a living, defeating poverty, um, improving their lifestyle, acquiring secular knowledge, and achieving their various goals, only a minority of them have taken up the task to exert themselves in attaining the greatest objective of all. Everything I mentioned earlier is certainly not the greatest objective of all. Only a minority have taken it upon themselves to strive and exert all the efforts which Allah gave them to accomplish and attain this objective due to the lack of reflection due to lack of reflection on the prophetic traditions the ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, many have assumed that this is a, a simple task attaining this objective is something easy something that can be done with great ease and the truth is this is not the case. It is not easy. Why? And what is that objective? The objective will, is understood from the following narration, so listen attentively. In a hadith which was narrated by an Nasai and Tirmidhi and uh, Ahmed and Ibn Majah and many others, Sahih hadith, different wording of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, افترقت اليهود على إحدى وسبعين فرقة وافترقت النصارى على اثنتين وسبعين فرقة وتفترق أمتي على ثلاث وسبعين فرقة كلها في النار إلا واحدة قالوا من هي يا رسول الله قال ما أنا عليه اليوم وأصحابي وفي رواية من كان على مثل ما أنا عليه اليوم وأصحابي وفي رواية الجماعة إلى آخره. Listen to this very important narration. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, the Jews divided into 71 sects or denominations, and the Christians divided into 72 sects or denominations. وتفترق هذه الأمة and this أمة whose أمة of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم will divide into 73. Pay attention. More than the Jews. And more than the Christians, all of which will enter the fire, except one. They said, the Sahaba, Man hiya ya Rasulullah? Which is that group that will not enter the fire? He said, Whatever I am upon today and my companions. That one group which will not enter the hellfire is the group which will be upon the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. Now, if you had multiple choice, you had an exam, and the exam had four choices. For the correct answer, you had four choices. And let's say 
you don't know the answer. Guessing, let's say you get a guess. With four answers, what is the probability for you to guess the right answer? 25%. Imagine if you have 73 options, 73 choices. What are the chances of you guessing the right choice? Allah Alaihi Wasallam. But it is not very probable. So here we don't have like three, four groups, and you know you're, you 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 have 73 of them. Only one is the one that we're supposed to be on, and this is the title lecture. Are you one of them? Are we one of them? And are we striving to be of them? Have we really made the necessary investigation? Have we studied the matter extensively so that we are upon certainty that we are among them? Or is it mere assumptions? Is it something that you will find on Facebook? Is it just a video you will run across on YouTube? Just like that, and once you hear some speaker and you read some article, khalas, you on the path? No. As you will see, there's a lot of effort required. It is not just saying, well, I belong, I'm one of them. You have to do it. You have to understand the deen in the same manner and fashion the Prophet sallallahu applied it to the Sahaba. <laughs> the mere claim, everyone claims the same thing. Any Muslim or even the Shia, he will tell you the Quran and the Sunnah. And the Sunnah for them is Ahlul Bayt that they supposedly claim to be honoring and venerating when in fact they disgrace them and they speak of them but that's, that's a special lecture inshallah everyone will tell you Quran and Sunnah but which one is the Quran <coughs> and the Sunnah it is the one according to the way of the Prophet sallallahu and the early generations and we will explain so now you realize the danger do you realize the sense of danger you have to choose one out of 73 and according to the ulama and in these 73, there may be even, even further divisions. And not only that, these are part of the Ummah. We're not speaking about groups which are not even labeled as Muslims, like the Ahmadiyya and the Qadianiyya and what have you, the Nation of Islam in the States and other groups which have left Islam altogether. Still there are fitna. Now this is among the Muslims, those who remain within Islam, you have 73 of them. Only one. 72 misguided ones. One that is on the back. Now this, this one has to be understood in the light of none other but the Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha. You say in Surah Al-Fatiha what? Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. That straight path is that one, the path of that one group. Have you ever wondered why Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala made it obligatory that you ask for this path 17 times a day minimum and if you don't according to a good number of scholars and a position which is very favorable that you're no longer a Muslim if you don't pray you've left Islam so look at it if you don't ask for this path because you're not doing Salah you're not a Muslim to begin with you're something else. If you are Muslim, minimum 17 times a day. The average is 39 to 40. Assuming you pray one rakah of wutr, one. If you pray 11 rakahs of wutr, that's around 50 times a day. 50 times a day you ask Allah to give you the path of this one group. You see how, Allah, how important it is to Allah that you are upon this path? that you don't go left or right this is in the Fatiha which we recite every day the problem with us is when was the last time we stood in Salah and really when we said إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim, we felt and we meant in the depth of our heart Oh Allah give me that path of the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba when was the last time we did that? you don't need to answer me probably Fatiha has become a ritual a condition for the validity of the Salah as for the understanding the reaction to the ayat the application in our lives this may be absent among 
a, group, a good number of Muslims. And we ask Allah to change our affair and our conditions. And our condition. But the truth is, we're supposed to feel it. We should really ask Allah to give us that path because it's not cheap. And most people are not upon it. Most Muslims today are not upon this path. The majority are among the 72 groups. The minority are upon this path which we have been striving to call to and to live up to ourselves. And we're falling short. We need Allah's aid and assistance to fulfill the requirements of this particular, to fulfill the requirements of this particular path. And we will see inshallah ta'ala what it requires of us. طيب. Now this has to be further understood. Now look, it's like a chain reaction. You understand the hadith of the 73 sects and the light of the path, one path. That is the one you asked for in the Surah Al-Fatiha. For further clarification and reinforcement, listen to this hadith of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu ardar, and the hadith of Sahih. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Ibn Mas'ud said, خط لنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خطا بيده ثم قال هذا سبيل الله مستقيما ثم خط خطوطا عن يمينه وشماله وقال هذه سبل هذه سبل على كل سبيل منها شيطان يدعو إليه ثم قرأ قوله تعالى وأن هذا صراط مستقيما فاتبعوه ولا تتبعوا السبل فتفرق بكم عن سبيله ابن مسعود said the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم drew a line with his hand he drew a line a straight line and he said to the sahaba هذا سبيل الله مستقيما this is Allah's path straight this is the path of Allah straight then he drew lines on the right of it and on the left he drew lines on the right and on the left of that straight path he said هذه سبل these are other paths each one of these paths has a devil calling you to himself or calling you to that path, depending on what the ha, the damir, is referring to. يَدْعُوا إِلَيْهِ أَيْ إِلَى السَّبِيلِ أَوْ إِلَى نَفْسِهِ إِلَى الشَّيْطَانِ On each one of these paths, there's a devil who may have a beard, who may wear a turban, who may be wearing a thobe, who may appear to be adhering to the teachings of Islam, who may call himself scholar, Shaykh al-Islam, like Tahir al-Qadri, this newest clown in the Muslim Ummah, this liar, fabricator, may Allah remove him and get rid of him as soon as possible because he comes on YouTube and he says, he brings books, no one knows Arabic. He sees a bunch of people don't know Arabic. Oh, this hadith is he lies, fabricate against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyone who has 0.05% knowledge, he knows he's a liar. But the, the average people don't know. So he runs his mouth. And he claims that the, the deen is the tasawwuf and that the sahaba did this. All these are lies against the Messenger of Allah. Anyways, a special lecture will be dedicated to his lies, exposing him bi Now, this is related to what I'm doing right now. Pay attention now. Putting <coughs> you to himself. I'm saying this because some individuals among the Muslims who are emotional and personally attached to individuals criticize the fact that at times we mention the names of other people involved in da'wah and other so-called scholars. And we say, brother, why you do that? You're dividing the ummah. You're this, you're backbiting. Say, Habibi, you don't understand the deen properly. This is an obligation. The fatwa of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is what? Shaytanun yad'u ilayh. He's a devil. Are you supposed to warn against the devil or call people to the devil? Are you not supposed to war against the devil and his clan? Inevitably. And part of that is warning against deviant individuals. Now, time out. There's moderation. We're none of those whose whole life is fetching for people's mistakes. Someone who's on the Sunnah, known for being on the Sunnah, and we don't like him for whatever reason. 
He has a different nationality. He speaks English better than we do. He learned from another school. He graduated with a, with a higher degree than us. People have all kinds of personal envy, envious issues. So we don't like him. So oh, let me listen now to all of his lectures. Even though he's on the Sunnah, let me find the mistakes. Then I fetch for these mistakes, which any human being may do, and then we expose him. Be careful of Fulan. But Fulan is from Ahl Sunnah. Fulan is on, he has mistakes. Do you not have mistakes? You looking for his mistakes. Are you free from mistakes? If you want to point out the mistakes, no doubt. Any sheikh, if he made a mistake, will say that is an error in the sheikh's statement. We don't undermine the sheikh himself. Because no one is ma'soom but the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa No one is free from error, infallible, in conveying the deen, except the Messenger of Allah. So we're not going to extremes. You will notice that when we mention someone, we'll mention someone that no two sound Muslims on the Sunnah will differ about his deviance. Sami, uh, Hamza Yusuf, and uh, Kabbani, and uh, Sheikh Nazim, these, no Muslim who loves the Sunnah will think twice that these individuals are not individuals that you learn the deen from. But some other Muslims who are involved in da'wah, who may make mistakes here and there, like myself, it is not fair to go and fetch for their mistake and undermine them and degrade them in the name of something. When it's usually personal, strictly personal. I don't like him. So let me find his mistakes. Otherwise, warning against the devil is an obligation. There are 73 sects. There are other paths, other than the path of the Messenger of Allah, where the shaitan calling to himself, if you don't expose him, then the average Muslim does not know any better. Specifically in this day and time. Yani at the time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and Asba'a Tabi'een, the, the predominant situation was what? The Sunnah. The people were adhering to the deen. The, those who deviated were a minority. They were a minority. So even if you ignore them, if you did hajjah, you simply abandoned them and boycott them, it does the job. But today, the, the people out there, the people in charge of the TV stations and what have, predominantly are not open to Sunnah. So the average Muslim, where will he learn? <coughs> How will he know? He may learn the incorrect information if the people of knowledge do not indicate who is the one whom you can take knowledge from and who is the one who you need to be careful about. Again, those who are deviant beyond the shadow of doubt. Not Sunnah people with mistakes. And if there are mistakes, we make them clear. Right. Now, who are this, this group, this one, one group, one sect, which the Prophet ﷺ said that they will be saved? Who are they? They are the elite. They are the distinguished. They are the supreme. They are the strangers. We will see why. They are the most beloved to Allah. They are among the Muslims, the most beloved to Allah, and they are the true followers of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the ones whose love to Him is the most genuine and sincere. How is that? Because you will find that every innovator will claim that every follower of the Sunnah strictly does not love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't celebrate Mawlid? Oh, you don't love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't believe in the fabricated narration that the first thing which Allah created was the Nur of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Oh, you don't love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This hadith, يعني, uh, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ مَا خَلَقَ رَبَّكَ نُورُ مُحَمَّدِ يَا جَابِرُ this hadith which you will not find in Bukhari, or Muslim, or Nasai, or Tirmidhi, or Abu Dawood, or Ibn Majah, none of the books of hadith. It's a Sufi fabricated narration, which is the fundamental belief of the Sufis, predominantly, that the Muhammad is the, the first thing Allah created is the Nur of Muhammad Wasallam, And he is the reason why everything was created. He is the reason, and this is deviance. And if you oppose them, they will not stop. No, no, you don't love the Messenger of Allah. Ya subhanallah. Ya akhi, we strive, we're not there, we strive to love him in the best way possible by believing in what he said and acting upon it. 
not by celebrating his mawlid when he didn't celebrate his mawlid, nor did his sahaba, and not by giving him titles which he didn't give to himself, nor did Allah give to him, nor did the sahaba. He used to hate it when he would walk in for someone to stand for him. You know the mere act of standing, it's very common in the culture here. He, the Sahaba said, no, we, no one used to glory, used to venerate the Messenger of Allah وسلم, more than us. And we would not stand when he would arrive due to us knowing how much he hated that. When, when people said, Anta Sayyiduna, he said, As Sayyidullah, you are our leader, you are our master. He said, Allah is the master. Because in that context, they were trying to give him something above. Even though he said about himself, "Ana Sayyid Walad Adam Yawm Al Qiyamah," I am the Sayyid of the, I am the master of the children of Adam on the day of judgment. But because he's trying to close the door for shirk, now what he's saying about himself is from Allah. When the people call him Sayyid, and Allah is the ultimate master, and this may lead to shirk, he had to stop and said, "As Sayyidullah," he said, "Say what you're saying, or part of what you're saying, and do not over exaggerate another hadith." Do not over exaggerate, do not exaggerate in praising me. Don't praise me like the Christians did to Jesus. Verily I am the slave of Allah and his messenger, so say the slave of Allah and his messenger. But this is not what they do today, Ahlul Bid'ah. They give him titles, like uh, uh, the, 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 the Burda, right? That what? That part of his knowledge is the knowledge of Allah wal Qala, the preserved tablet and the pen. Part of the knowledge of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when the young girls were singing, uh, that among us is a prophet who knows the right, he said, don't say that. Don't say that I know the future. Even though Allah gave him some information about the future, <coughs> he did not allow the two young girls during Eid to claim or to say that he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. This guy says, part of his knowledge is the preserved tablet and the pen. That's everything. They didn't leave anything for Allah. Wallahi musta'an. So they are those who truly love them. They are الطائفة المنصورة والفرقة الناجية. الطائفة المنصورة. منصورة from نصرة. نصر. إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح. The aid. The victory. They are the victorious group. والفرقة الناجية. And they are the saved sect. As for the reason why they were called <coughs> saved. Because they were saved in this dunya from innovations and from misguidance and subsequently they would be saved on Yawm Al-Qiyamah from Jahannam. They would not go to the fire. They were saved from deviance and innovations so they would be saved in, on the day of uh, Yawm Al-Resurrection, on the day of resurrection. And in some of the ahadith, the Sahaba said, Man hiya al-firqa al Ya Rasulullah, man al-firqa al-Najiyah, in some of the words of the hadith, which some of the scholars authenticated. They said, Oh Messenger of Allah, who is the saved sect? And he told them that, that whoever is upon what I am and my Sahaba. So it comes in some of the wordings of the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba called them Al Firq al Najiya, the saved sect. Al Ta'if al Mansura, they are victorious. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, La tazalu ta'ifatun min ummati mansurina, la yadurruhum man khadalahum, hatta taqum as they shall remain, there shall remain a group of my ummah, mansoorin, aided, supported, victorious. And some of the other authentic narrations, zahirin, they will be above, supreme, evident. You cannot hide them. The people of Sunnah, you cannot hide them. No matter how many deviant people are there, Allah Azza wa Jal will bring someone every hundred years that will renew and revive the condition of the ummah with the, with the ulama. They you will always know the ulama. They will not cease, the, they will not disappear. Bi'idnillah azza wa jal. Zahirin. La yadurruhum man khadalahum. They will not be harmed by those who abandon them or forsake them until the hour is established. It doesn't matter if all the people of innovation call them Wahhabis and they call them, you know, this, they go to all kinds of names and war against them, they will not be harmed by all those who warn against them, all those who abandon them, all those who, all those who disappoint them by not coming with them upon the truth, they will not be harmed until the hour is established. They will remain. Are you one of them? Insha'Allah Ta'ala. Now, let me tell you something 
about what Allah said about them. Just so you will know their virtue. What are their virtues? والسابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار والذين اتبعوهم بإحسان رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه. And the first and the foremost among the muhajirin, those who did hijrah from Mecca to Medina and before that from Mecca to Ethiopia and then having to return, والأنصار those who were in Medina that accepted them and aided them and helped them. والذين اتبعوهم and those who follow them, follow them exactly in excellence. Those who follow them in their ways of goodness. What is the beautiful result? Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Him. Now look, look. No matter how righteous you think you are. No matter how righteous you think you are. Can you say that Allah is pleased with me now? Can one of us say Allah is pleased with me? You don't have the right to do so. In fact, if you said that, that's probably the first step towards deviance. Because Allah says, وَلَا تُزَكُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't praise and purify yourselves. In this sense, by saying that I'm pure, I'm, I'm, you know, this, I'm good. Don't. We cannot say, we hope, we have good, we hope inshallah because of the effort inshallah we will receive, receive Allah's pleasure but can any one of us give them himself a title no but the sahaba Allah gave him that title and Allah didn't stop with the sahaba al-muhazir al-sah wal-ladheena ittaba'uhum bi ihsan if you follow them on their way of excellence then inshallah Allah will be pleased with you as well and if Allah is pleased with you you know where you're going and if Allah is displeased with you you also know where you're going and that's the most important thing in life. It is not about updating your Facebook. That you just had a, a, a cup of orange juice. And 15 comments, you know, about, oh, with pulp or without pulp. Was it orange or was it yellowish? Nonsense. And these people, you know, it, 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 supposedly it's an Islamic thing. And every five days, they put a video of some deviant dad. And the rest of the stuff is junk, junk, junk. And if you speak to them, he will tell you, I'm, oh, I'm going straight to Jannah. Because I belong to this group. I, I belong to this, you know. Since when? Since when? I've never seen the people of Sunnah, never in my life. Seen the people of Sunnah posing for pictures, never in my life. Not at, until recently. The ulama, the ulama, who may be in this situation, usually the pictures are taken, you know, by the press because of uh, authentication and documentation or whatever. But have you ever seen a scholar of the Salaf posing with a big beard and then uploading his picture on Facebook? Never, Wallah. Wallah, the people of the Sunnah, they don't even, they don't even uh, you know, consider this to be halal. The whole idea of this. The whole idea of taking a picture is haram according to the majority of them. Let's say there's a slight minority who allowed it. Those who allow it, when was the last time one of them posed? So you get these, these people saying, I'm on this and I'm part of this class, and he's posing with, you know, with all kinds. No, Habibi. Now this year is a title. And I hate to tell you, but I have to tell you, you're not living up, you're not living up to the, the way of these people. We all have our shortcomings. But there are things which we can control and there are things which we cannot control. You can control not taking a picture of yourself. Believe me. You can do it. It's very easy. And you can do it. You don't have to upload a picture of yourself. That's very easy. Yeah, we may not be able to do many other things after struggling, but I don't think you need to struggle to stop yourself from taking a picture of yourself and uploading on Facebook. No, Habibi. It's not that easy, brothers. Seriously, Wallah, it's not that easy. It's not something that you will learn within five minutes. It's not, okay, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, oh, mashallah. Okay, I'm, I'm one of this, one of these groups. You will see why. When we go into the actual characteristics of them, you will see what we have to learn and how much we have to do until we reach that particular point. Fine. Either, uh, this is what Allah said about them. The Prophet Sallallahu said about them, Hadith of Bukhari Muslim, Hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, خَيْرٌ nas قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ <laughs> the best of mankind. The best of mankind after the prophets. My generation is my generation. 
than those who follow them, than those who follow them. This is the summary, this is the crux of the whole matter. If we understood this correctly, all of our issues will be resolved bi idnillah. If we understand that the best people are the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and Atba' al Tabi'een, so we live Islam and understand it and apply it per their understanding, then we have started to travel upon the path, the path of that one group. Until then, no. And I will give you a, a, a practical example that happened to me this morning. One of the brothers who belong, maybe he belongs to one of these sects, anyways, he follows the Hanafi Madhab blindly. Mashi? We're not saying that those who follow the Hanafi Madhab are not part of this path, but that's a, a sign of danger. He comes to the masjid every morning, and he prays four rakat. So, as I told you before, the masjid is the place for Amr bin Ma'roof, wa na'al munkar. You don't be quiet, you have to speak. Sadi Akhi barakallahu feek. I noticed that you pray for rakat. You don't assume, just so you won't wrong him, what are you praying? I know what he's praying. I know he's praying the Hayd al-Masjid, then the Sunnah of Fajr. But I don't say that because I may be wrong. He said, no, that's not what I'm doing. So I said, what are you praying? He said, the Hayd al-Masjid, then Sunnah al-Fajr. I said, listen, Akhi, Tahiyyat al-Masjid is a salah which is done when there's nothing else to pray. Yani if you come into the masjid and there's nothing else for you to do, there's no salah for you to pray, then you don't sit down until you pray and we call that two rak'at Tahiyyat al-Masjid. If there's another intention, if you want to pray the Sunnah of Fajr or the Sunnah of Dhuhr or the Sunnah of Maghrib or whatever, then you no longer have the Sunnah of Maghrib, as because you know, that's after Maghrib, any other Sunnah, then you no longer have to pray Tahiyyat al-Masjid. You don't even have that intention anymore. Tahiyyat al-Masjid is dropped because the whole idea is that don't sit down until you pray. And if you pray the Sunnah of Fajr, you've done your job. So the brother said, no. Why are you saying that? I said, because this is a time of prohibition of Salah. And the only thing the Prophet ﷺ did, he prayed the two rakat of Fajr. So you can't pray more than that. The Sahaba didn't pray more than that. You have to stick to that. The whole idea of the Hayat al masjid is not. Now, it didn't get pretty. It got ugly. And one of, the, one of the ways of the people of desire is what? Turning the tables around. When he, was, when he wasn't able to answer me, he said, yeah, where's your cap? I'm wearing a cap now. I wasn't wearing one in the masjid. I said, what does the cap have to do with this? He said, you're saying sunnah, sunnah. What sunnah are you telling me not to do? Where's your cap? Isn't the cap sunnah? He said, listen, Akhi, we don't want to now shift the issue. Because we can shift it and I can prove to you that it's not a sunnah. Where are your leather sandals like that of the Prophet ﷺ? Where are they? And what is this you wear? Why aren't you wearing like the Messenger of Allah? Did he wear a white coat like this with these buttons? Now he wasn't able to answer. Then he said, of course, when he, we reach this dead end, he said, leave me alone. Now listen, I'm just trying to teach you something. He came this morning, he prayed six rakats. Allah al wallahi. I'm sitting there like, man, this brother, man, really wants to start trouble with me, akhi. You know, I don't know what's up with these people, man, but anyways, that's life. Six rakats. I wonder where the other two came from, but I didn't, I was going to be quiet. I said, you know what, it's going to cause fitna in the masjid, because sometimes if, enjo- if forbidding the evil will create more evil, you zip it. As soon as he finished, he spoke to me. Salam alaikum, alaikum salam. I try to be nice and barakallah, good to see you again. Um, he said, you told me yesterday about the hate al-masjid. He said, yes. And he made me explain to him the whole thing again. He said, yeah. He pulled out a piece of paper from his, from his pocket. He said, this hadith, in Bukhari Sharif. Bukhari Sharif. Beautiful. Bukhari, no problem with me. He said the hadith says that between every, and he wrote it in Arabic, with the tashkil, with the fatha dhamma kasra. Two narrations. He said the hadith says between every adhan and iqama, there are two rak'at. I said, okay. He said, so, what's wrong with, why are you stopping me? The hadith says that I can pray two rak'at between adhan and iqama. Said, Akhi, what does that have to do with the, our issue? Tayyib, no problem between every adhan and iqama. You can pray two rak'at. He said, so I'm praying the hadith al-masjid. Meaning the hadith says, you can pray. It doesn't say rak'at. It just says pray. There's a prayer. He said, that means I can pray. I said, Habibi, you cannot bring one hadith from Bukhari without looking into other textual evidences and apply it according to your understanding. This is not the way of the people of that one path, by the way. You cannot just read hadith al-Bukhari. Brother, I said, this is a'am. This is general. 
and you must look into other specifying narrations. A hadith khasa. So khasa said al hadith. We went back and forth. Dead end. Then I remember by Allah's grace, these new technology which I hope that you use it for da'wah and not for entertainment. The whole Islamic library is here. And I have uh, the, uh, books of Hanafi fiqh. Hanafi fiqh. I went into the book of the Ahnaf, into the book of fiqh al-ibadah for some person called uh, Hajj, uh, something in Hanbali or uh, Hanbali, something along these lines. And I put Rak'atayn Fajr. And it says, among the times when it is disliked to pray, and they quote it, Fajr, and there's a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu says, La Salah, there's no Salah after, after the time of Fajr except Rak'atayn Fajr. And he was like dumbfounded, like, I said, Akhi, see here, it says, al fiqh al Hanafi. I know he's a Hanafi. al fiqh al Hanafi. This is your scholars, and this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ telling you, don't pray anything after Fajr comes in except the two rak'ah of Fajr. And the conversation ended. What is the point? The point is that the people who, or who go on that path don't use this methodology. I don't go searching for one hadith in Bukhari Muslim and say, no, I will apply it in this fashion according to my desires because I understand. No. How did the Sahaba understand it? And what did the Prophet ﷺ really say? And are there other narrations which further explain it? After we get all this investigation out of the way and we have clarity upon the Sunnah, then and only then I act upon the Sunnah. I don't follow desires. You see the difference? This is the quality of the people of that path. They, are, they, they must refer to the khayrun nas, to the best of generations, the best of people they must, because they understood these narrations, they conveyed them to us. If the Sahaba never prayed more than two rak'at between the Adhan of Fajr and the Iqama, then you don't pray any more than that. Because you're not better than them, and you sure don't understand the deen better than they did. Clear? Beautiful. That was alhamdulillah. Allah decrees that these things happen before the lectures, so they can be integrated with the event, so you won't think I'm crazy. Sorry. Their characteristics. <coughs> what are the characteristics of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Al Firq al Najiya, Wa Ta'if al Mansura, Atba' al Salaf al Salih, Ahl al Hadith, the people of Hadith. And I'm not naming, I'm not naming groups. I'm speaking about their way. The people of Hadith are those who follow the Hadith of the Prophet before anything and anyone. We will see further, inshaAllah ta'ala. The first characteristic is that they hate sectarianism. They hate division. They hate that the Muslims are not united under one slogan of the correct understanding of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They don't like it. And the reason why they don't like it because Allah doesn't like it. And the way of the people of that one path is that anything which Allah loves, they love. And anything which Allah hates, they hate. And Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأُولَئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And do not be like those who تَفَرَّقُوا They divided. وَاخْتَلَفُوا Then they differed. After the clear proofs came, came to them. After the clear proofs came to them. And for those there is a great punishment. Don't be like them. Don't divide. Don't separate. Don't differ amongst each other after the truth has come to you. Once the truth comes, all of you must unite upon it. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ Verily, those who divide their religion and they became Shia, sects and groups, لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ You have nothing to do with them. You are not part of them. This is Allah telling the Prophet ﷺ, you have nothing to do with these people, fi shaykh, in anything. You have absolutely nothing to do with them. Who? Those who divide their groups and they became Shia. In the ayah, kullu hizbin bima ladayhim farihun. Every group happy and content with what they have. This is our book, this is our tariqah, this is our way of da'wah, this is the, the name of our organization, these are the names of blah blah blah, khalas. Anything outside this, 
is wrong. Shaykh al-Sad al rahimahullah, Allah, said in commenting on this ayah, said in, the, in commenting in, in his book Al-Fatawa, anyone who puts up an individual, regardless of who, the, who this individual is, if you take him up as the ultimate person, like in the Ahnaf, Al-Imam Al-Azam, Imam Abu Hanifa, then you, you love people or you have enmity against them, depending on this person. Per this person, then he is among those whom Allah said about Farrahuddinahum wa kanu Shia. He's among those who have divided their religion and they became sects. If you take one individual and your enmity and love with the Muslims is based on him, whatever he says, whatever he does, only no one else. And he said, as for those who have fiqh, for the men who have fiqh and learned the deen from the people of knowledge, then it is not right for them to set up their scholars, or yeah, to set up an individual, and, and then they make, the, they make them the standard on which they uh, affiliate with people, or they boycott them. This is also part of dividing the deen. So we are not attached to fulan, sheikh, one sheikh. Like you find the people of the tasawwuf and others, they have one sheikh. And his sheikh t- took it from another, you know, tariqa, and from another sheikh, it's like inheritance. No, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we have ulama, and we're not confined to the living ones, we go all the way back to the first ones. From the Sahaba, Tabi'een, Adba'u Tabi'een, then the ulama of the Ummah, or the four Madahib, and Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, and the so on and so forth. We're not confined to an individual where our whole religion is based on him. They don't like sectarianism. And the Hadith of Hudayfa, the famous hadith of Hudayfa, he said the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah about good. And I used to ask him about evil, because I was afraid that I would come across it. So he asked him, uh, 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 will there be good after this evil? Then he said, will there be an evil after this good? And so on and so forth. Until he made it to the hadith where he said, will there be any evil after the goodness which the Prophet ﷺ spoke about? He said, naam. Du'atun ala abwabi jahannam man ajabahum ilayha qadafuhu fiha. Prophet ﷺ told them about the things that will happen in this ummah, they will be du'at. People, propagators, standing at the doorsteps of Jahannam. Whoever responds to them, they will toss them and cast them in Jahannam. The Prophet ﷺ said, there will come a time where people will call you Jahannam. Come follow our way, come follow our deviated, invented, innovated way. Come join our sect and our group. They're calling people to Jahannam. Then, they're calling people to Jahannam. Then, Hudayba said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, in case I, I reach this point and there's no more Imam, there's no leader, there's no Jama'ah, what do I do? He said, I'tazil tilka al kullaha. He said, Abandon all of these groups. Even if you were to bite on a branch of a tree and death comes upon you in this state, then let it be. Do not become a membership, a cardholder membership of any group in this sense. A group with names. The methodology, you have no choice. The way is the way of the Salaf, the way of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in. There is no dispute about that. And we have no reservations, nor are we afraid, nor do we you know, compromise with it. The way of the Salaf is the way. Any other way is a deviant way leading you to Jahannam. We must be upon it. The naming issue is debatable. And we can quote some scholars who say, and some scholars who say, but it's not really about the name, it's about the essence. You can carry the name. I can give you, uh, I can print a business card that says Dr. Ahmed. And you don't even know how to put a band-aid on a wound. And even if I put a doctor for you, that's not going to make you a doctor. But you can be a doctor and I fail to give you a business card that mentions doctor before your name. It doesn't undermine and it doesn't affect your validity and your credibility. Why? You're a doctor. So we want to live it. We don't want to say it. We want to live it. The second characteristic of the, the path, Al-Firq al Najah or Ta'if al-Mansura, is they don't follow their desires and they do not entertain innovations or innovators whatsoever. Because Allah said about them, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَىٰ Have you not seen, have you seen the one who's taken his desires as his God? as his object of worship, as the one who tells him what's halal and what's haram, what to do, what not to do, his own desires. Have you not seen them? They have taken their desires as their God. Oh, this is the characteristic of all people of innovation. His idea, his understanding of this one hadith, he will apply it. Not the understanding 
of the, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. And when Allah wanted to describe on the other hand the believers, He said, and when He wanted to criticize those who don't have the qualities, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا Nay, by your Lord and Master, they shall not believe. You will not believe. I will not believe until we make the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the one who decides concerning any matters which we differ about. And after his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will refer to what? His Sunnah. We will not believe until we refer to the Sunnah. Not to I think, I like, Mawlana, Shaykh, Fulan, no. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And after you refer to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you don't have haraj, you don't have any discomfort, any dislike against his ruling. When he said don't do it, you don't feel discomfort, uneasy. You don't feel that way. Rather, you're totally happy. وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا Like, نَزَّلْنَاهُ تَنْزِيلًا for, we, we, for emphasis, you submit in full 100% submission to the sunnah. For you to truly be a believer, qualified for Jannah, you must refer to the Sunnah, don't hate it afterwards, and submit in total submission. So when we deliver the lecture about the hell equals garment, and about the pants being above the ankles, and we mention all the evidences concerning that, and we deliver the lecture about letting the beard grow, I'm just giving you simple things. There are many other things which may be more important, but these are the simplest things which any one of us can do. If until today we haven't acted upon it, brother in Islam, this ayah applies to you. You shall not believe until when you refer to the sunnah and it becomes clear to you, you don't hate it and you submit. If you hated the ruling and you still shave your beard, you're not satisfied with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If your pants are still below the ankles, same thing can go. Now we need to be very careful. See how delicate this is? It's very delicate. Now we must move on. Yeah, Akhi, submit to Allah, you're going to meet Him soon. We're not here for entertainment. So what, you have some facial hair that the people don't like? Who cares? With Allah, this may allow you to Jannah or throw you in Jahannam. Facial hair, facial hair, why? It's the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And Allah negated believe from you until you reach this level. إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمَا يَقُولُ سَمِعْنَا the only statement of the true believers, not the fake ones, when they're called to Allah and His Messenger to judge between them, is they say, we hear and we obey. We're not the Jews. We're not the Jews. We hear and we disobey. No. We hear and we obey. Until we obey, we're not really part of the believers in the ultimate sense. And the quality of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, al Ta'if al Mansura, wal Firq al Najir, is that their Iman is sound. They love the Sunnah, they live by the Sunnah, they teach the Sunnah, and they don't care about anyone who opposes the Sunnah. Inshallah, everyone at work will criticize you tomorrow. It does not matter to you because Allah is pleased. Radiallahu anhum wa radu This is the mentality. If every Muslim had this, wallah, we will be in the best condition today. But unfortunately, it is absent. We don't all feel this way. We ask Allah to make us feel this way. But this is the fine line between guidance and deviance. وَمَن يُشَفِّقِ الرَّسُولِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعَ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Allah further warned us, whoever opposes the messenger after the guidance has become clear, manifest, and he follows a path other than that of the believers, which were the Sahaba at the time of revelation, we will allow him to travel on this path, but we will cast him in Jahannam and what an evil abode. Allah will let the person go astray. But on the day, on the day of reckoning, Yawm al-Din, he cannot say, Oh Allah, I want Jannah, because you did not qualify to enter Jannah. Why? You oppose the messenger. We need to be careful. Hadith of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu wa ardah, which was narrated by Ahmed and Abu Dawood in the Hadith of Sahih, he said, وَإِنَّهُ سَيَخْرُجُ فِي أُمَّتِي أَقْوَامٌ تَجَارَى بِهِمْ تِلْكَ الْأَهْوَاءِ كَمَا يَتَجَارَى الْكَلَبُ بِصَاحِبِهِ 
لا يبقى منه عرق ولا عرق ومفصل الا دخله معاويه سال الحديث of the صلى الله عليه وسلم and barely they will come up, come out they will come out from my ummah a group of people who their desires will run through them like rabies run through the one who's, who's afflicted with it you know rabies when a dog be, you know will, will have rabies or a human being it, it goes everywhere he said they, the desires will run through them like rabies run with the one who's suffering from it it will not leave عرقن, a vein ولا مفصل or a joint except that it will enter it their desires will be all over them it will not leave a vein or a joint except that their desires are the ones that will lead them left or right front and back are we among those? we need to be careful this is not the characteristic of Ahl Sunnah طيب and we have the other hadith of Al-Arbad ibn Sariya when Prophet ﷺ told them whoever lives amongst you will see a lot of difference upon you is my Sunnah and the Sunnah of the rightly guided Khulafa buy on it with your molar teeth and woe to you from introducing anything into this deen because every newly introduced matter is misguidance all these narrations are reinforcing the same concept but time is running so I want to move on to the next characteristic of the people uh, uh, the Ta'if al-Mansura wal firq al najiyah they don't follow anyone blindly is there an exception? is there an exception? Yes? Who is the exception? No. The Messenger of Allah You better believe we follow him blindly. We follow him blindly or not? You better follow him blindly. Because you know what it means when you don't follow him blindly? Meaning you will only do what you agree with. Blindly, meaning you don't, you don't use your brain. And you know, you may use your brain to understand what he said. But if you want to use your brain to reject what he said, then you don't need your brain anymore. You need to follow him blindly. He's the only one we follow blindly. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayuha al-ladheena amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yadayi illahi wa rasoolih wa attaqu Allah inna Allah samiyun alim. And Allah Allah warned us in the beginning of Surah Al-Hujurat. O you who have believed, do not put yourself forth before Allah and His Messenger. Don't go ahead before the revelation and the command and the sunnah. Don't go against the sunnah and fear Allah. Verily Allah is all hearing, all knowing. Furthermore, Ibn Abbas and this, this particular narrative, there's a discussion among the ulama about the wording and the authenticity of the wording. But either way, <coughs> it, it, it exists that Ibn Abbas said to the people, يُوشِكُ أَن تَنْزِلَ عَلَيْكُمْ حِجَارَةٌ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ أَقُولُ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَتَقُولُونَ قَالَ أَبُو بَكْرٍ وَعُمَرٍ He said to some of the people, stones are about to fall upon you from the heavens, from the skies. I tell you, the Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you tell me Abu Bakr and Umar said, even though Abu Bakr and Umar are Abu Bakr and Umar, and we were commanded to follow Abu Bakr and Umar because they are from the right against the Khulafa. Still, if they're going to say something which opposes the Messenger of Allah, you can expect stones to follow you from the sky because we don't give anyone over precedence. So, as much as we love Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and wallahi, we love him, Allah is our witness, and we love Imam Shafi'i, and we love Imam Malik, and we love Imam Ahmed, and al Uzai, and Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and Sufyan al-Thawri, and Sa'id ibn Musayyib, and we can name many of the ulama. Wallahi, we love them, but not more than the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And no matter how much we love them, we will never choose them over the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If they're in agreement with them, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. If one of them by mistake, and Allah will reward him for his effort, is in disagreement with the Sunnah, we will favor the Sunnah. We don't have Al-Imam Al-A'zam Abu Hanifa. We have Al-Imam Al-A'zam Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we love Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah, but within limitations. Why? He's a human being. And he said, if the hadith is sahih, then you better know this is my madhab. This is my style, my way, is the authentic narration. And you know during his time, many authentic narrations did not reach him. Subsequently, you will find that he often takes the general principles of the Qur'an, and you will find among the Ahnaf, the most violations against the Sunnah are among the Hanafis. Truth, truth to be said. Not because Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was not teaching the Sunnah, because during his time, he had limited resources. And per his resources, he conveyed. 
when the ilm spread and the people collected the ahadith of Bukhari and Muslim and Imam Ahmad was a muhaddith, Imam Shafi'i was a muhaddith, Imam Malik had the, was, was also in the science of hadith, he had the muwatta of Imam Malik, they had more knowledge of hadith, so they were closer to the sunnah in terms of the ibadat and the usul and what have you. That's the truth. This is why you find when you, you know, when someone follows Imam Hanifa blindly, it really makes life difficult. He will stand on the salah, he doesn't want to put his foot next to yours. Even though the sunnah is that you put your ankle with his ankle. And he wants to put his arms over his, under his navel. And you try to pray next to someone like this, you can't, you can't even put your arms anywhere. It, it, it doesn't work. We just become very separated. No raising the hands, and no, it's a total different salah. Two people pray next to each other, you think that they're from different religions. Excuse me. Different but Why? Because he, he cannot... He cannot possibly forsake Imam Abu Hanifa. Even if he saw Bukhari, the Prophet did this, he raised his hand, he moved his finger. So, no, no way, no way. Some of them, Allah, even I'm telling you, if, yani, if they, he saw the Messenger of Allah in his dream and he told him this, he would probably wake up and say, Imam Abu Hanifa. It's a sickness among some. Wallahi, it's a sickness among some. The way of the righteous predecessors is that no matter how much we love and respect the, the, the Sahaba and the Ulama, no one will come close in status to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. طيب أهل السنة والجماعة الطائفة المنصورة والفرقة الناجية They believe firmly in Allah's names and attributes. And this aspect of the lecture requires a lecture of its own. But I will briefly give you the main distinct differences between the Ta'if al Mansura and the deviant groups. We believe everything Allah described Himself with in the Quran. And we believe in everything Allah described Himself with through the Prophet. So that the Prophet described Allah with that through that without tahrif, without distorting the meaning. Without ta'teel, without denying the meaning, without tamthil, likening Allah to His creation, and without tashbih uh, or taqeef, say how. This is, by the way, this is the this is the crucial point, which means that we believe Allah has a face, and Allah has two hands, and Allah has fingers, and Allah has a foot. And Allah has eyes. Pay attention. Allah is above the throne, above the creation. We don't limit Him to a place. He's above His creation. Place is part of His creation. Allah is above everything. He descends to the lowest heaven as He wills every last third of every night. He speaks as He wills. He does as He wills. He will place His foot in Jahannam until it will say, Qat, Qat. And read the ayah. يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمْ هَلْ امْتَلَأْتِ وَتَقُولُ هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ The day when you say to Jahannam, Are you filled? Are you filled? Are you full? It will say, Is there any more? In the authentic hadith, That الرَّبْ يَضَعُ قَدَمَهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى حَتَّى يَنْزَوِي بَعْضُهُ عَلَى بَعْضُ فَتَقُولُ قَطْ قَطْ Allah will place His foot until it will be squeezed to the corner. Jahannam will say, Enough, enough. We believe. And we believe that there's nothing like Allah. This is the most important point. There's nothing like Allah. So when we believe in Allah's face, we don't have any images of faces and we're not thinking of human beings. Same thing goes for the hands, fingers, foot, eyes, and so on and so forth. Now the people of the Mu'tazilites are those who, uh, the Mu'tazilites are those who deny Allah's names and attributes. Uh, no, the Mu'tazilites are the ones who deny Allah's names, uh, attributes, and they believe in the names. The Jahmites, the Jahmiyyah are those, and the Ghulat among them, they deny Allah's names and attributes. The Asha'ira, they deny Allah's, they accept Allah's names, deny His attributes except seven. You will find that these to them, they will reject them because they say we're doing tanzi. We're trying to, perfect, we're trying to grant perfection to Allah, glorify Him above these qualities. So you say to them, just to give you the summary, you say, look man, you're denying the fact that Allah has a face because we have faces? He will say yes. 
even though Allah said in the Quran, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything upon earth will perish. And the, the, the face of your Lord will remain full of glory and honor. Even though Allah said in the Quran, وَجْ You're going to deny it? Because what? We have this, he will say, yeah. Hands. Allah said to Iblis, مَا مَنَعَكَ أَنْ تَسْجُدَ لِمَا خَلَقْتُ بِيَدَيْ What prevented you from prostrating to that which I created with both of my hands? Allah said about himself, بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ Nay, but both of his hands are stretched out. Are you denying them? Because we also have hands? He will say yes. Say, okay, fair enough. Does Allah have a life? Hayat? He will say yes. Do you have a life? He will say yes. Say, then you must deny Allah's life because you have a life. You understand? Do you hear? Say yes. Does Allah hear? Yes. Akhi, you must deny Allah's hearing because you hear. And if you continue to do this, you don't have an object of worship anymore. You don't have anything anymore. You're lost. So you don't use this silly philosophical Greek-based analogy to understand Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. When the Prophet ﷺ was giving these narrations to the Sahaba, when he was telling them that Allah will smile, Allah will laugh, Allah will laugh, yadhaq, Allah will laugh. He was telling them that the quloob bayna asba'ini min asabi'illah, never use your hands. The hearts are between two fingers of the fingers of Allah. When Allah's Messenger ﷺ said this to the Sahaba, do you think they understood Arabic? Did they understand Arabic? Did they understand Arabic? They did. They know what asabi means. Did any one of them say, oh, Mr. Jalot, what does that really mean? Or did he say, that doesn't really mean fingers, it means, you know, status, it means situation. Never did he elaborate, never did they question him, they took him face value. They understood it according to the apparent meaning. This is my job and yours. Why? Because they understood what Allah said, Laysa kamithli shay, there's nothing co-equal to Allah. So we, we believe in that. And this is the belief system of Imam Ahmed, Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, the whole Imams. This is what they believe. And many of the people who follow them blindly in fiqh do not believe in what they believe concerning Allah's names and attributes. You follow me? You know what we believe now? And you really must study this matter. So you, because you know the shaitan will play tricks with you. You must have yaqeen. Wallahi, we have yaqeen, no doubt. No doubt when Allah used the term in the Quran to describe himself, I don't dare to tell Allah no. I don't dare to do so. When the message of Allah did not do so, and the Sahaba did not do so. So we believe in what Allah described himself with. The people of innovation and bid'ah, they don't. They will deny all of these. Concerning Qadr, we are not like the Qadariyya nor like the Jabariyya. The Qadariyya are those who say that everything, that Allah doesn't know what you do until after you do it. After you do something, Allah discovers that you did ABC. Jabariyya, they say, you have no choice. Everything you do, Allah forced you to do it. So Allah created you, forced you to sin, then face you in Jahannam because of what He forced you to do. Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah say no. Allah Azza wa Jal gave us the free will, and our free will is conditioned to His free will. You will after Allah wills. But we don't know what the outcome of things is, so we have the decree, we have the free will. You can, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wishes, whoever wills to believe, and whoever wills, may disbelieve. Allah gave us the choice. So we're not like the Qadariyya or the Jabariyya. We're not like the Khawarij. Those who say that if you commit major sin, you're a kafir. If you drink alcohol, you have left Islam. If you commit adultery, you have left Islam. And this is extreme. Nor are we like the Murji'ah. Those who say that Iman has nothing to do with good deeds. Yani, they say, the Iman of Iblis is equal to the Iman of Abu Bakr. They say, the Iman of Iblis is equal to the Iman of Abu Bakr. And the Iman of the worst of this Ummah is equal to the Iman of Abu Bakr. Why? Because they believe in the principles. They believe there's Allah, there are angels, there are books, revelations, there's the last day, there's pre-decree. You don't have to do anything because of that. Whereas we believe what? Iman wa amal salih. Al Iman wa bid'un wa sattuna shu'ba a'laha qawlu la ilaha illallah wa anna imatatul adha ala tariq wa al hayaa shu'ba dun min al Iman. The Prophet said Iman is 60 some branches, the highest of which is saying la ilaha illallah, and the least is removing harm from the way. Isn't removing harm in action? He was describing what? Iman. So part of Iman is moving harm 
moving filth out of the people's way. And haya is a branch of iman. And we have many evidences which support that. We are not like the Shia who declare the Sahaba to be kuffar and, uh, and deify Ali, nor are we like the Khawarij who uh, did the other, who declared the Sahaba to be kuffar. The Shia one they glorified Ali and the Khawarij they did the opposite. And we have two opposite extremes. So Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah are on a middle path between all of these deviant groups concerning the matters of belief. Concerning the belief in Allah's names and attributes, they believe in what Iman is and the definition of Iman, they believe in Qadr and they believe in our, our position concerning the Sahaba, we travel upon the middle path. Brothers and sisters, we need to learn these matters. Have we learned them? Have you read a book on Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Have you read a book about the belief about the Sahaba? Have you read a book about the belief in, among Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah? What is Iman and is righteousness part of it? Have we learned these matters? Do we know them? If not, then we need to strive, as I said in the beginning, not to just earn a living and increase our you know, sustenance. No, we need to strive to learn what this is, the one path, one tariqah, one firqah that will not go to the fire, that will be upon the way of the Prophet and Sahaba. You must believe what they believe. They know these matters pretty clearly. We need to follow their way. Tayyip. Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, al Taif al Mansur al Firq al Najah, they value Tawheed. And this is from an email, Brother Sand Barakallah. They value Tawheed. The most important thing in our deen is the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jalla and singling Him out in worship. So we don't entertain grave worshipping, we don't entertain uh, calling upon other than Allah, doing tawassul through the creatures, uh, you know, seeking barakah from people. All of this is not accepted among Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say my prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death are for Allah the Lord of the worlds. بِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتُ وَأَنَا أَوَّلْ الْمُسْلِمِ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ Allah has no partners with him. This is what I have been commanded among the first. I am among the first who submit to Allah Azza wa Jal. We don't entertain shirk in any of its various manifestations. Tawheed is fundamental. And this is the da'wah. This is what every Prophet was sent to do. And this is what every follower of the Prophet did after the Prophet passed away. They lived up to the call of Tawheed. Not anything else before that. This is among the characteristics of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. فَعْبُدِ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينَ أَلَا لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِصِ So worship Allah, being sincere to him in the religion. Is it for Allah the sincere religion? لَا تَجْعَلْ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَاهَ نَقَرْ Do not make with Allah other gods, other rivals. All these are ayat where Allah is emphasizing the importance of Tawheed. So, let me give you the summary. The main difference between Al-Ta'if Al-Mansura, Wal-Firq Al-Najiyah, and the other 72 sects is two things. At-Talaqi Wal-Istidlal. At-Talaqi is the resource. The source from which we take our deen is from the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma'ah. Not aql. The mu'tazila, the source is not, is not this. The aql, the mind, come first. And like al Razi and others, Fakhr al Razi, he said that the ayat of the Quran are not yaqiniya. Then they, they do not, they do not provide certainty. Aql, your mind, is what will give you certainty. For the ayat of Allah, they're doubtful. Ajib. And many others who made a mistake, that's a huge mistake. But I'm telling you where the error is, so you will know. And a lot of the Mufassireen had deviated in terms of this matter <coughs> of the belief system. So, At-Talaqi wal istidlal The source is Quran, Sunnah, Ijma'ah. Not what I think and what I understand. And Al-Talaqi, this is the Talaqi. Istidlal is the actual application of the evidence per the situation. Like the Khawarij. They will take an ayah from the Qur'an which may indicate that if you commit the major sin you're a disbeliever and they will apply it all across the board. Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah don't do that. They look at the general understanding of the ayat and the narrations and they deduce the ruling from the general understanding. From the what? The general understanding. Because some ayat further explain other ayat. You may read the ayah Inna Allah la yaghfiru wa yushraka bih wa yaghfiru ma dhuna dhalika li Allah does not forgive 
that you ascribe any partners with him, and he forgives whatever is lesser than that to whoever he wills. And if you understand this ayah alone, you may understand that Allah will not forgive anyone who committed shirk ever. And not only dying. If you don't read other ayat where Allah says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلْ عَمْلًا صَالِحًا Then you will think that this ayah means that Allah will never forgive you once you've committed shirk once in your life. You follow me? So you have to look at all the evidences. To do, who do you, do you need? Ulama. You need scholars to do this. So this is the matter of istidlal. And I will conclude this lecture with the following. The, in, the famous and wonderful statement of Imam Malik rahimahullah. مَنْ اِبْتَدَعَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ بِدْعَةً فَرَآهَا حَسَنًا فَقَدْ زَعَمَ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ خَانَ الرِّسَالَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَقُولْ اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا فما لم يكن يومئذ دينا فلا يكون اليوم دينا ولن يصلح آخر هذه الأمة إلا ما صلح به أولها Whoever innovates, introduces something into Islam and he perceives it as something good he has alleged that the Prophet وسلم, has betrayed the message of Islam because Allah said in the Quran, this day, on the day of Arafah, I have completed your religion for you, I have perfected your religion for you, Akbar, and I have completed my favor upon you, and I am pleased with Islam as a way of life for you. Imam Malik said, whatever was not part of the deen when this ayah was revealed, on that day, cannot become part of the deen today. And nothing will rectify the, la the latter, the last, the late part of this ummah, except that which rectified the first part. We will not go back to the honor, to the dignity, to the being the supreme nation until we go back to what rectified their condition. What rectified their condition? Their strict adherence to the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the first, first three generations. So I say, Ya Muslims, Ya Muslims, all over the world, here and elsewhere, we are in a very critical time in this Ummah. We have been suffering a blow after a blow. Something which we haven't experienced in our past. No matter how bad the condition of Muslims were, uh, or was, never were we in a condition where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be made fun of, and drawings will be made about him, and we are still we. This never happened before. When a woman among the Muslims, a woman, she was harassed by some of the kuffar and she screamed from the other side of the earth, Wa Mu'atasama, who was the leader, the Amir Baghdad Wa Mu'atasama, he sent a letter to the people. He said, We will bring an army which will begin in our land and end in yours. So they sent this woman back safely. Even when the Muslims were going through all kinds of suffering, never did we reach this low situation like we have today. Why? Because we don't act upon this way of life. So we need to change our ways. Every one of us must make it his ultimate objective in life to live up to these standards and to raise his children upon these standards. We don't need Nasheed and we don't need Playstations and we don't need Nintendos, we don't need games, we don't need entertainment, we don't need that anymore. We have plenty of that 24 hours, 7 days a week. We need Deen. Adherence, people of knowledge, people of da'wah, and application. If you want this ummah to change. If you don't care for the ummah, then Allah alam what will happen to one of us on the day of judgment if we don't care for this ummah. And this is not the condition of the real followers of this ummah. We love for the ummah what we love for ourselves. So we must make this move. And the tax, the penalty, is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا كَمَا بَدَأَ فَطُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَةِ قَالُوا مَنْ هُمْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ الَّذِينَ يَصْلُحُونَ إِذَا فَسَدَ النَّاسِ وَفِي رِوَايَةِ الَّذِينَ يُصْلِحُونَ مَا أَفْسَدَ النَّاسِ وَفِي رِوَايَةِ أُنَاسٌ صالحون قليل في أناس سيئ سوء قليل كثير الذين يعصونهم أكثر مما يطيعونهم أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم three different wordings and they are more they are those who are upright when the people go corrupt. Strangers. He said, uh, Islam began as strange, it will return to being strange, give glad tidings, give the good news to the strangers. They said, who are they, O Messenger of Allah? He said, those who remain upright when the people go astray. 
That's one quality which we must have. You can't be like every time they can hear you. You must be a real Muslim. The second quality, الَّذِينَ يُصْلِحُونَ مَا أَفْسَدَ الناس. وفي رواية مِنْ سُنَّتِي مِنْ بَعْدِي Those who rectify what the people may corrupt. Not only you rectify yourself, you rectify others. And in some of the narrations, my sunnah, they rectify of my sunnah what the people have ruined after me. And in one narration, there will be a minority of righteous people among a majority of evil people. Those who will disobey them will be way more than those who obey them. So this is the tax. You will become a stranger. You will have fingers pointed at you. You will have people warning against you. You will have people leaving filthy comments on your lectures if you ever deliver any. You are the one who will get attacks in emails. You are the one who will be spoken about. That's fine. This is the tax for you to go to Jannah. For you to be part of this, for these strangers. You will be a minority among many evil people. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, are you one of them? If so, Alhamdulillah. Strive and raise your children accordingly. If you're not, Alhamdulillah who, who has given us a chance to make a change. Learn this deen. We have classes in Aqidah. In English. No excuse for anyone here. Classes in Aqidah about the very topic which I discussed right now. The names and attributes of Allah. For the brothers. Sisters, it's recorded. You can get the recording and listen. No excuse. We have classes in Tafsir. We are, there, there's da'wah going on in English per this methodology. Alhamdulillah. It's available. No excuse. Get involved. Learn and teach. Otherwise, we may not make it. I ask Allah to accept our deeds and pardon our shortcomings. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد